my name is Dean Chandler. I'm the head of business development here at The Viewpoint. Uh, for those of you who don't know or are curious, The Viewpoint is a ad monetization platform, um, CTV, OTT specific and exclusive. We don't play in the legacy space. Um, we built it from the ground up to help those publishers on the, in the streaming space uh, to sort of streamline and monetize better, um, bringing a value proposition of, of deep, deep uh, reporting and analysis, and as well as a uh, flat fix CPM to avoid sort of rev share bloat um, from SSP partners. Um, so um, this year, we, just as a reminder, we presented our first CTV monetization guidebook. You can visit theviewpoint.com to, to find that guide. Now with that little self-serving ad out of the way, um, I'd like to welcome you to uh, TVB Talks, which is a ongoing series, a webinar series. And some point, um, hopefully, uh, we will get to um, variants uh, aside, we will get together and get to do these in person uh, in New York City and around the globe. Um, uh, we launched this series last year. Uh, we've gone through, I think this is going to be our fifth, and we had, we've ranged topics from launching a CTV channel to uh, DPO, SPO, and other um, TLAs. Uh, that's three letter acronyms for those of you. Um, add an audience measurement um, and then CTV trends going into 2022. And I'm in December, I'm sure that was a very original topic of 2022 trends. Um, this time we'll be discussing something that was brought up by one of our panelists, though, and I think we call it Mike for it. Um, just how to define, I massaged it a little bit, but uh, how to define, refine, and create value in the CTV ecosystem with and for all the parties involved in that ecosystem, including, of course, the user, which is the end game for everyone. Um, uh, one final note there, if you can, want, you can watch these webinars on YouTube channel, and of course, don't forget to subscribe. So I guess the self-serving ads weren't over when I said it were. They were. Um, real quick, just some housekeeping stuff and some admin stuff on this particular webinar. Um, we'll talk to the guests for about 30 minutes. It'll be a loose exchange of ideas and uh, debate. And then um, you'll have opportunities to ask questions. Those questions, if when if time permitting, we'll get to at the end. Just post them in the chat and we'll take care of them and we'll cover them as they come. Um, so before we get started, let me, uh, let me introduce uh, our amazing big, big brain panel of uh, guests. Um, Eric Keith, he's the president of Space Mob Studios, which is an answer media company. Um, Eric incidentally um, helped me celebrate my birthday three years ago when we were stuck in Vail together. Um, Eric is a member of the Producers Guild of America and Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. He has served as producer for, uh, and the CEO of Capstone, Capstone Entertainment for the past 16 years. And through that created uh, the CTV OTT production distribution company, Space Mob Studios. He's worked on multiple award-winning shows for major studios, including ABC, Univers NBC, Universal, CNBC, HBO, Sony Pictures, Warner Brothers Television, and Balloon Entertainment. And the list goes on and on, and I don't want to inflate his ego anymore. But um, I want to welcome Eric to the, the dice here. Uh, next, we have Eric, um, Mike Richter. Uh, He's the VP of Global Revenue Operations and CTV and Digital for Trusted Media Brands. Uh, motivated by his passion for strategy, innovation uh, in media and ad tech and, and, and sparked by great ideas to bring to the fore, um, Mike leads Global CTV and Digital Revenue for TMB. Uh, he's a driving force, I can say this for sure, behind the strategy and revenue growth of TMB, which is formerly Juke and Media, um, streaming brands like Fail Army, The Pet Collective, People are awesome, Weather Spy, and more. Um, in addition to CTV, Mike leads the team behind TMB's programmatic operations uh, across TMB's portfolio of market leading internet publication, Reader Digest, Taste of Home, Family Handyman, and many more evergreen titles. Next is Richie Hyden. Uh, Richie is the co founder and COO of Iris TV, uh, doing incredible things in the video data platform that enables better viewing experiences and advertising outcomes. Uh, an expert in video data connectivity. Richie has helped media and marketers maximize the value of their investment in connected TV and online video. Richie held operations and marketing roles at Jukebox, 
Television, where he is responsible for, was responsible for accelerating the growth of the team and development of the company's video data video platform, video data platform. Um, now, last but of course not least, Joe Marino, who is head of, head of client success at MadHive. As head of the client success organization, Joe oversees revenue generation and builds client relationships. Uh, during his tenure at MadHive, Joe has grown the business from five clients to over 30, um, bringing on new broadcast and radio station groups, national brands, direct to consumer brands, agencies, and other unique resellers. So to put that in context, we have someone from the demand side, we have someone from the supply side, we have someone who's creating content for CTV, and then we're creating, oh, and then we also have with us in Iris TV, someone who's bringing depth and perspective to all these things from, uh, for, from contextual level. But I'm sure we'll have opportunity to talk about all of those things as we go into it. So um, let's get started. For those in the audience playing along, anytime you hear the word value, take a drink. So good luck. Um, so the premise here is CTP publishers, CTP suppliers, uh, CTV demand, those who work to uh, provide context and value along this, along this chain. Um, want to get the most value and bring the most value to the consumer and to themselves. Um, so let's figure out what the right balance is, shall we? Um, and so to start that, let me ask a primary question here, eight minutes into this, uh, is, uh, I mean, this is a, give me a one word or one phrase answer to this. Yes, no, maybe, depends. Um, is CTV inventory, as a unique entity in this sort of uh, ad ecosystem as a whole, is it undervalued, overvalued, or properly valued by the brands that buy it? Uh, I'll go with Mike first. Thanks for tossing me a loaded question. Uh, you know, on purpose. CTV, <laughs> I've been playing in the CTV space for I want to say close to seven, almost seven years now, and um, it. There's a different sect of buyers for each one of those comments. And Hold each on, one this, is, this, is, this is just a two to so, three word question. No, I know, I know. If, <laughs> undecided. Perfect, yes. Uh, Richie. I'd say undervalued, currently. Eric. Uh, I would say originals are undervalued uh, tremendously uh, and the rest of it may be overvalued. Great. Now, Joe. I would say depends. This is the kind of thing I wanted to have happen. Thank you. So um, it's a matter of perspective, I think. So uh, Joe, first question to you. Uh, failing thinking is that value means different things to buyers and suppliers, right? So one wants something for as little as possible while the other is offering the same thing for as much as possible. Is, the right, is that the right premise or is it flawed? Are we still doing one word answers? No, now, no, now you get to blow it out. Um, I, I feel like I still want to answer the first question. I would say it's, um, they're, it's they're interrelated because I'm going to give it to Mike next and he's going to answer both. Yeah, I would say it's flawed. I mean, I think Eric brings up a really good point about originals. Um, we're seeing such a wide variety of price points for, you know, just binge worthy content or what you would consider maybe tier two, tier three aggregators of content, MVPDs, or even just publishers themselves versus premium publishers. Then we're seeing, you know, new folks come to the table with CPMs that are in the 70s and $80, uh, which to me, I was, I was blown away when I saw that. Um, so yeah, I would say it's, it's pretty flawed because you're right. One side wants it as low as possible. One side wants it as high as possible. And you have all these players in the middle, just trying to help navigate and support both sides while keeping their companies afloat. Uh, so that's that's my as quick as possible answer to that one. It didn't have to be quick um, at all, um, Mike. But I think you touched on some things there, like all the things, all all of the variables that are happening. So, sort of same question to you, um, uh, or we can even add, you know, if the two principles are the demand side, supply side. What's the first step to making finding true value? Is it partnership? Is it uh, all doing the same thing at the same time? Well, I mean, the reality is this, 
I'm sorry. The reality of all, all of it is let's talk about the product at the end of the day. We're talking about content. Content is simply just the vehicle to get to the product. The product are the people that are watching that. And we're and supply and demand is what rules the valuation of anything in this world. That is simply the rule of economics. So when you look at, I, I come from the original, originally I come from the linear t- television world of selling TV, and supply and demand was based on looking at GRPs, which shows had the supply that buyers are looking for, and if those shows were highly purchased up, guess what? The costs go up. It's very similar to that in CTV. Where CTV is still flawed is we do not have a unique measurement system that everybody can agree upon. And without being able to measure and agree upon that in a currency that works for everybody. And I'm not saying we need a one currency rules them all situation because we all know what happens there and we've seen it in the past. It doesn't work well. It's we're, we're witnessing that it doesn't work well right now. We do know that panels are still in some capacity required, but we need a different approach to how we panel the users to see it in a more open, interoperable way to be able to measure against that. So the $70, $80 CPMs that Joe's seeing, there are highly specific niche audiences that specific advertisers are looking for and they're willing to pay that. And if you take GRPs today in a traditional linear space and you reverse them into impressions, you do have CPMs that range anywhere from $5 all the way to 500. So it does, I I don't think there's an issue in sense of saying that those $70, $80 are overvalued. I think the flaw does come to the fact that we're trying to move and build this house while the storm is currently happening and we're starting to stay sheltered at the same time and it's a little messy. We have to figure out measurement right now. And that doesn't mean find somebody to do one one measurement to rule them all. We have to find a way to make a interoperable system where everybody can work together, where we all feel is transparent and trustworthy. Right, so that that goes back to uh, what Joe was talking about, all those people, all those companies in the middle that are trying to provide the shelter, provide this measurement, right? Um, To then, maximize for the Nikes of the world, the audience they want to get while making sure that um, the trust media brands of the world uh, get um, get those ad dollars at the at a correct value price, right, Mike? So- no, I, I agree with you on that. And I think the other thing too is there there's a new theme right now that's starting up uh, in the last quarter. Uh, that is focused for this year, outcome-based advertising and CTV. I don't think we're ready for that. I think we want that, but I don't think we're ready for that because we can't, because that goes back to measurement. And that goes back to being on measure at scale to be able to prove outcome-based. This is still a branding scenario. So we have to figure out what are we going for here? Right. Um, so um, Joe, I'm going to come back to you with something real quick. Um, just from a uh, UX perspective, right? What are the key components that viewers have with, you know, key problems that viewers have with, we know, okay, let's, let's put out the examples of what the problems that viewers have with ads in the CTV space. And then, um, uh, Joe, I'll start with you and then Rachel might be able to jump in here. Um, so some of the problems, right? Poor loading, ad latency, irrelevant ads, repeatable ads, repeatable ads, repeatable ads. Um, uh, how, how do you fix that? How do you, what do you work How do you work through those problems to get them solved? Uh, You're throwing real loaded questions out here. Um, I'm scared to answer some of these. No, it's um, a lot of the players in the ecosystem have to learn to play nice in the sandbox, right? Um, Right. We do have both sides of the coin. We have folks on the supply side calling directly to brands and clients. And when you do that, you miss some of the um, technology that helps you to navigate what you're describing, right? Like over-frequenting or running ads back to back to back to back. I see that a ton on Hulu. Um, you know, so I think an, an education of the ecosystem is important. You know, if you go here, here's what you could get. If you go here, here's what you could get. Here's what you're looking for. An understanding of um, householding, right? You are mm-hmm. trying to take digital sensibilities and applying it to a household, which is traditional linear mindset. And people kind of get lost in that shuffle. Um, these types of technologies that exist, household device graphs, uh, household frequency control, all of these things are very valuable and important in uh, solving what you're describing, as well as just delivering relevant ads to the right audience, uh, which we could get into data and in, I guess later, but for now it's, you know, if data is in a good place, then yeah, you're, you're going to help solve that as well. All right. Isn't some of the onus, and I'll offer this up to anybody, isn't some of the onus on the, um, the orders, the 
demands that the that the brands are making on their agencies or the, 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 the demand side platforms that are buying for them. And that um, we talk to folks and everyone's looking for FEP, FEP, premium, FEP, FEP. And that speaks to a very narrow view of, of premium and, and, and what's going to move the needle. Um, so is I don't want to get anyone in trouble with any of their clients, but isn't isn't there something about educating them on the expanded universe? Yeah, I think to to tie a couple of the subjects together, I think the in in our opinion, one of the biggest issues in the CTV space right now is is transparency, um, and that's not because sellers are holding something away from buyers necessarily. Um, sure, there's some data sets that are proprietary, and that you know some. Uh, ecosystems or platforms want to keep as much of that to themselves for strategy reasons. That's okay. Um, but the real fundamental transparency issue is that, uh, you know, as Mike said, like the client here and the actual asset we're trying to get to is the consumer and what we're putting in front of them is content and no one in the ecosystem understands what content we're putting in front of said consumer. That's a huge problem. So <laughs> yeah. that's an infrastructure problem, you know, predominantly. And that's because, the world of video was built on the heels of the display business and made it work. And the CTV business is being built on the heels of online video. And we're realizing that a single video being delivered to consumers in an on-demand fashion, which is the predominant majority of online video, is not the way that television and CTV is actually distributed. We do have schedules. We do have multi-ad pod breaks. We do have rev shares and inventory shares in those ad pod breaks. And so that doesn't operate in the same way as online video pre-roll in front of a you know, three minute video um, from an infrastructure perspective at all. Um, and then amplify that with the fact that we have text on web pages and we don't have any text on, on a CTV screen. So, so the solutions for understanding the type of content that an ad was running adjacent to just don't exist. And you know, a lot of those issues are then amplified by the fact that we have buyers that are transitioning from digital into CTV and they're used to having those data sets. And so that's a hard conversation to navigate as an agency or a DSP on why that's not possible. Like, why can't I run my campaign across both formats and get the same insights? Like, that doesn't make any sense to me as a buyer. Um, and then you've got television buyers and TV buyers are used to buying, you know, content plus con you know, audience plus content. And, you know, hey, I want to buy the Super Bowl or I want to buy This Is Us at 8 p.m. And that's a very difficult thing to do in CTV um, right now. So I think those are my comment at the beginning. Like, is it undervalued? We believe yes, highly. And that's because no one knows what the true value of, of the content is right now. Now, well, one thing I'd love to add to that, if I can, just on the please. Point, also to what you were saying, Dean, around the type of content we're talking about. We tend to, this industry tends to focus on the attributes of the content and not the attributes of the experience. So we talk about FEP, we talk about long form, we talk about prime time, but why does that even matter? And why does it value, why is it valued more over something that's daytime or that might not be a, a, a super long form or it might not be, it might not come from one of the, large, the four large studio producers. And what that means is you have to look at engagement. Engagement is based in the whole value of a primetime show in traditional TV is because more people are sitting in front of the TV at that point in time and they're looking to see what happens next. So if the gorgeous thing about CTV is we can measure engagement at much more detailed scale than we were ever able to do so in linear. And we're able to prove now as well that that type of engagement is happening across more than just what we were assuming in the past was a certain sect of shows. And that should be the value prop that we're driving is what type of engagement we're looking for, not so much what type of actual program we're looking for. Right. And I'm going to play off of something you just said there, Mike, in the back half there. And so Eric, I'm gonna bring you into this as, as a content creator and it's content creator that now has access to sort of in pre-production almost. And it could be because you're, you're working specifically with a Subaru type brand or whatever of you have these data points that is that you are often, is in, often influencing possibly your, um, your creative decisions. So content's still king though, right? Um, does that, does that hold up with CTV? And then if you sort of speak to 
the decision making or the or the production of this content as it relates to CTV versus the it's different to linear or whatever the, or digital or whatever the case may be. Let me start by sort of just you know kind of clarifying where we fit into the ecosystem. So we uh, we have an originals program where we. Uh, finance and produce original content that we then distribute with the various platforms. Uh, we also have a development program where uh, you know every platform under the sun in the last year has announced, hey, we've got $300 million uh, to spend on development projects, or we've got $200 million or whatever, but you add it all up and it's over a billion dollars, you know, probably you know, one and a half billion dollars of development funds that are being accessed by groups like ours to go off and produce uh, original series for the platforms. Uh, and then the final piece of it for us is uh, we create you know, fast channels that we distribute across uh, the various platforms. And so we create, and we like to say curate uh, original experiences that audience that a specific audience would enjoy and take to. So your question about uh, you know sponsorship and how much does that sort of influence uh, what we do? I, I would say it's a it's a lot. You know, like we have sponsors that come to us and say, "Hey, we're interested in LGBTQ uh, content." And we're willing to put up X amount of dollars if you can guarantee me uh, this amount of viewership. Um, and of course we can't guarantee it, but we can have our, you know, distribution partner kind of, you know, speculate, <laughs> you know, and that, that's about as good as it can get at this point where, you know, back in the day on, on television, on all my children, they would say, you're going to get this much traffic because we know it, you know, and now it's kind of more of a guessing game. I don't know if that helps, but that's a start. Yeah. No, it, it does, but it, and it, it sort of brings up the other question of something I was thinking of when Richie was speaking is this, we can all agree, right? That CTV is a bit of a, um, uh, it's a Frankenstein, right? Because I, I, I came from, I've done this for 25, 24, 25 years in just specifically the digital space. I've grown up in it. You know, I was going to Poppy Tyson, which is an agency in Connecticut that had Snickers, but they didn't even have a digital um agency part of that I didn't even have a digital agency person and um ctv is sort of this it's, it brings the expectations of linear broadcast right but it's built on this foundation of, of digital data so um and eric you sort of validated what i was thinking is that there's somebody out there is saying the data shows and granted uh soap operas or or, or primetime tv always has there's panels that tell us there's what the audience might like. And if you're going to like a team, you might like Riptide. It's probably dating myself a little bit, but something along those lines. And so, um, uh, so we sort of validated that there's a, there's a new equation, right, Eric, between uh, when you're making something for CTV versus something else. There's, but, I mean, it's, it's the wild, wild west. I know we, we say that, you know, every few years about some aspect of advertising, whether it's, you know, working with publishers on digital or, or, uh, you know, here we are in the OTT space and everybody's, you know, truly having to speculate as to, you know, is this program valuable to this particular platform because of the audience that it delivered? I mean, like, it, it really, I don't, I'm not sure people know, like, and as we started pitching the platforms, and I'm probably saying more than I should, um, a lot Don't of the like groups that. just don't have a solid plan yet as to what they're looking for um, or what direction they should go in. And they're working on it and they're not really spending money until they have that plan in place, which is, you know, good, good for them, bad for us because we're sitting with great ideas waiting to, you know, go make more series. But, uh, you know, I do think it's kind of tricky for them to even know, all right, well, you know, what audience should we be targeting? Which, you know, which of our channels are most successful? What, you know, there's so many determinants, right? What's going to bring the greatest uh, value uh, somebody can drink? Um, you know, uh, highest CPMs, 
for the original content that we're bringing to the table? And is there any difference between originals, as I stated earlier, versus recycling, you know, 1980s, you know, another world right. episodes, you know, or is it the same value? Right. And then that, so Richie, I'm going to turn to you now. So whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, a different world, Magnum PI, um, whatever, uh, if you can find contextual notes to play off of, right. Um, then it, the value for both those things might be equal, whether it's original or whether it's uh, something repeat. How are you guys sort of navigating that or working to, to, uh, to solve that? Um, yeah. So on your side. So we're, yeah, so we're, we're basically, we're what we call a video data platform. And so what we sort of specialize in is how do we um, work with publishers to basically ingest all of their content, um, the, both the files, the transcripts, the metadata, all the information about that asset, whether it's a six second clip or a, you know, 60 minute, you know, documentary or three hour film, it doesn't make any difference to us. So how do we ingest and sort of organize all of that data um, so that we can uh, have basically access to the source, the source code, right? The actual source data of the, of the videos um, for the purpose of how do we connect it with data companies, right? We're not a data, com we're not a data company. Uh, we're a data connectivity platform. Right. And so we sort of specialize in how do we take that source data, connect it to constituents in the market that want to analyze that content. It could be contextual providers that want to pull you know, topical information by analyzing the images on the screen. Um, it could be brand safety companies wanting to sort of cast judgment over the suitability of, an, of a video. And that could obviously have varying opinions. Um, but we also have partners that are doing logo detection, object recognition, people, places, moods, tone. There's, there's a lot of depth to the piece of content. So it's really about how do we enrich the asset um, before it goes out to the consumer. And then the second piece is then how do we locate that video in an ad request? And a big missing piece in the industry has been, you know, a, a persistent ID for a video. And so a very self-serving plug, we, we built one called the Iris ID. And the Iris ID basically travels from sellers to buyers and allows constituents in the market to understand what an ad is going to run adjacent to. And uh, the reason we sort of built these things is that we sat down with both buyers and publishers and publishers said, hey, I have a wealth of data on my assets, but I have no vehicle for mark, you know, to take that to market. And buyers said, I don't know what type of content my ad runs adjacent to. And if I could understand that and measure that and verify that, I would spend more with that publisher. Um, so that's why I think a lot of these issues, they come back to, to transparency. Right. Um, Joe, I'll let you relax your voice box for a little bit. Um, uh, how do you work through transparency? How do you, uh, you know, how do you try to be as transparent as possible? From your yeah, so, side. So that's what I was as as Richie and Mike and Eric were talking. I, I was kind of getting excited to jump in here. The the interesting that. yeah the interesting piece to all of this from my perspective is hearing content creators um, talk about how valuable their content is, but on the ad side, right? We don't have the ability to just go and buy directly into their content at the program level. Right. So you could go buy it directly if you sell it directly, which occurs and that that works. But then you're kind of like bifurcating the market and creating more structural issues and challenges and workflow challenges for agencies and brands. Right. Great point. Yeah. So from my perspective, I see, you know, the, the originals and all that value helping the consumer who says, I want to go watch this on said platform because I like that program and I'll pay X amount a month to enjoy that content. But on the ad side, since I can't actually go hit that specific program, and again, you know, Richie's got a really great tool to help us get as close as we can, uh, but the ecosystem really has to open up to allow us to get in there. So some companies are starting to do that, but generally it comes with large budget requests. Um, it's going to be a higher CPM always, and you're going to have to commit pretty large budgets to get that done. And again, you're bifurcating the market. You have to buy like that and then buy like that. And it ruins the ability to kind of holistically look at your target audience and consolidate it. So until the entire ecosystem matures and they feel more comfortable, not kind of dictating how they want to sell their content, um, you know, we'll always kind of be held at that mercy. Right. So, yeah, right. You'll always have to keep 
building ladders for the walled gardens, right? As for, cause that's, it's gonna be one line item and the other line items are the others. And then is that, uh, Mike, would that compel you to build your own walled garden or are you more for uh, open concept? I'm a bigger believer in open concept. I, I think that the concept of pure competition went out the door a couple of years ago when we opened up this realm of being able to reach the audience, not so much reaching specific content to, jo to Joe's point. There are better ways that we can expose the content. Uh, there, there is an aspect of brand safety. Uh, you know, I want to make sure that we're delivering ads that make sense for the viewers. For, you know, I, I think brand safety has turned into an advertiser top advertiser word and it left the realm of publisher when it should still be the publisher word because it's a matter of we're trying to That's keep point. we're trying to keep people on our channels. Um, and if there is there, there's all the stories we've heard in the past of where a viewer will call up an advertiser and say, I can't believe I saw you on this site. And we're like, well, why were you on that site? to start with. Um, that's always my response to a question like that. Uh, but you know, but it's I, I think it's a lot more harming to the brand of a publisher if somebody's watching a certain channel or on a certain site and they're expe they're expecting a certain experience and they then they see an ad for something that's of a certain category that they don't agree with and doesn't, doesn't even make sense for that viewing experience. In that capacity, I think that's where it's more damaging. And so, you know, there, there is that element of specific brand safety to not putting your ads next to certain stories per se. You know, for example, we go back to things like 9-11, things like January 6th, you know, people don't want to be associated with that. And we totally understand that. And that makes sense. But I, I think that in a general brand concept of brand safety, it should be more of a publisher term and advertisers should be focused more on user experience, user engagement, because that's what's going to drive the likelihood of that user to utilize their product. How do you, Joe, are you about to say something to that? Okay. How do you, how do you get it back? How do you, um, I'm, you know, I'm, my lineage is publisher. So how do you, how do you pull that narrative back for your brand safety is, should be owned by the publisher? Doing what we're doing right now, having these conversations, trying right. to try, try not being afraid to talk about it um and 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 not being afraid to say hey this was kind of a misconception of somebody that took this and ran with it who knows that could have been a term that was one of the hot topics of the year right like the hot topic this year is interoperability that is a term i don't think anybody used a year ago and now it's everybody's favorite word it's one of my favorite words i'm like yes i can pronounce it awesome um, i was gonna say it's hard to say you gotta practice it in the mirror a few times it is you gotta write it on the board and see it every day <laughs> uh but when, when it comes to that there is, it's, it's about figuring out, you know, where did we shift, right? I, I do think a lot of it did start shifting during, let's just say the past five years, because there was a certain period of time that nobody wanted to be associated with certain content. And that turned into that brand safety issue for advertisers. But coming from, for example, TMB, and, and I came from the Jukin side of TMB, we have a bunch of content. Yes, our content does start at a user-generated level, but it goes to an entire production team before it hits the TV television. And it goes through, and for example, we are extremely careful about what advertisers let into our content because the majority of our viewers are families. For example, on Pet Collective, it is a heavily family-focused um, network. Even on Fail Army, it is very like there. There, we have to be very careful because there's a lot of moms and a lot of you know older teens in, in some capacity that are watching, and we want to make sure that we are delivering both a quality experience as well as a quality advertising experience. So there is misconceptions. I'm constantly having to fight the ball, uh, the question of, well, you're user generated, you're not brand safe for my brand. I'm like. But we have an average viewership time of over 55 minutes a day. We have people that are engaging. We have a completion rate of over 95%. People aren't leaving channel. We have a render rate of over 85%, which means people are staying within the entire break. What is your question here? So we have to start asking, we have to start challenging these hard questions because buyers, as they continue to evolve in this space, and that's one element I think we're missing from this conversation as an actual buyer. Um, I think what's happening is uh, now, now, look, I do empathize with buyers. They unfortunately, um, they, they get the shitty end of the stick all the time. And, and there's tons of new con there's tons of new information being thrown at them. But we, you know, if, if we continue just being yes, yes, people around misconceived notions, we, we continue winding up where we are right now. So we have to start pushing back in a nice way, in an educated way. We have to do that. What kind of buyer, Mike? I'm sorry. I said, what kind of buyer?
TV. I'm talking about like at the agency and advertiser level. Or what do you mean by what kind of buyer? Uh, you know, TV, programmatic, digital. There's all these new types of buyers, video um, at these wholesale agencies now. So There is, well, but at the end of the day, they're all still attempting to do the same one thing, right? They're attempting to provide outcomes for their, for their advertisers, for their clients. That is the goal of an agency. So as long as we can, as long as all of us within this ecosystem can prove to be partners and prove that, hey, we're not looking to screw you over. We're looking to make you shine in front of your advertisers and we're here to help and even provide support. Say, hey, you know, do you want some of our team to come with you to talk to the advertiser? We're here to do that with you because they're strapped for cash. Agencies have been, have, have hit the, you know, the whole great resignation has really harmed agencies. Re I mean, I don't know who, who of us went to IP yesterday, but um, they were talking about that. You know, the great resignation really did hurt, hurt agencies. And so we are very fortunate within the ecosystem at the vendor and the publisher level that we, we, still have retained a good bit of our workforce. We are also trying to hire, you know, for example, I've got multiple roles open, um, but where we can help, can help the ecosystem. So provide that olive branch, I guess. Well, yeah, I think I think maybe just one other item on that. Like I could, couldn't agree more, Mike. I think it's like, I think I went to my first conference in like two years, the, the beat retreat at the end of last year, which was like awesome and weird and uh, it, was, it was amazing. Um, but I think one of the biggest things for the CTV world is like this industry needs to collaborate um, and needs to like discuss the best way for this ecosystem to grow and to expand. And one of the things that like we constantly get questions about just going back to this sort of notion of FEP, everyone says, hey, you guys have the content. You can see what's on the screen. Like I only want 30 minute episodes. And it's like very interesting to ask the buyer, like why? Like what? what's a 30 minute episode and and do you actually know that the majority of like scripted television from an inventory perspective on ctv is really small like it's not a big percentage of inventory right and so i think a lot of this is asking the the questions both buyers and sellers like what are you really trying to achieve how do we how can we get there with uh, the least amount of waste at the optimal price points with the best performance and all these things as opposed to saying well i just want to cherry pick this is us so well, you know, a fun, a fun point on that too, Richie, is this, is buyers want 30 minute episode, right? And then we're relying on tech because tech can pass the duration of a program today in a matter of minutes or a matter of seconds. But there is no episode at, on any television set today, on any distribution, CTV or, or cable or, or broadcast, that is actually 30 minutes or longer for a 30 minute block of time. It is, it, it ranges from what, 19 to 24, 30, 24 minutes, 30 seconds, somewhere, somewhere around there. The average is around between 22 and 24 and a half minutes for, yeah. for an episode. So if you, if we are also relying on technology, we have to change what does that mean for an episodic type program? Because nothing's going to meet that 30 minute episode requirement. Well, if, you know, and if there's a need for 30 minute full episode programming out there, if Eric, you can take his number down. He'd be more than happy to make it for you. Um, we're going to wrap this up, but I want to, uh, I'm going to pose sort of uh, uh, a question um, to each one of you. Same question um, or a version of it. So Joe, in the, um, in the short term, what, it, what makes an ideal partner um, on the other side of the, not the other side of the table, it's, it's a round table. So on the table with you, what makes an ideal partner when it comes to um, giving them uh, demand? Um, so we're talking uh, clients then, correct? You want to talk about advertisers? Correct. Yeah, sure. I would say someone who's willing to take recommendations, right? Uh, there are people as I think Mike, said earlier to the table with, I just want this, I just need this. And I need that this price point is very unrealistic and impossible to, to deliver upon all of those things. So someone who's willing to take recommendations, uh, who understands the space is helpful. Uh, we do get a lot of people who don't understand the space at all. And it gets tricky when you start working with them as, you know, they kind of move forward and then immediately either start to regret or start to ask a million questions. And so probably weren't ready. Uh, and someone who's flexible, right? Willing to understand that, you know, maybe it's not going to deliver and perform as great as DRTV will in the first two weeks. Uh, maybe, you know, we need to ramp up frequency a little bit, stuff like that. So I would say that's, that in my opinion is the ideal partner. Then also looking at the, uh, so partners when it comes to say, from the supply side, in a, in a, in a 
uh, short uh, form. What is what's your ideal partner on on that supply side? Someone who does what for you uh, and your brand? Brand yeah, I would say someone who's comfortable passing back as much data as possible, right? So we can be smarter about how we uh, optimize, smarter about how we target um, and how we can actually control more, right? If you're not passing back certain data points, we actually can't control a lot of things in the ecosystem with DSP technology uh, and someone who's willing to be as transparent as possible. Um, you know, we can understand, you know, some folks don't actually pass back length, uh, which makes it a little tricky for us when we're trying to decide what's online video versus connected TV or OTT. Um, so I would say those are the two things for us. Perfect. Eric, when you're talking to people and creating content or, or creating fast channels, uh, thanks for that, Joe. Um, what is it that you, you know, what is it your ideal client or ideal partner is going to provide you, Eric? Well, I mean, when I think about our originals program or, or development program, um, ideally, we find an advertiser who is willing to do some product placement, uh, which would help us with the financing of our of our content, in addition to whatever uh, fee we receive from the, uh, the platform themselves. So we're bringing more money to the table as a result of having X brand uh, on board. And even beyond that, um, you know, our parent company, Answer Media, you know, does, you know, sort of video monetization for OTT. Uh, if we could have a brand that would also then buy directly into our inventory shares, then, you know, we're kind of winning on all, on all fronts. So we've, we've created an experience for a brand who gets to get into content they believe in, and then further help them sell into uh, or buy into uh, other, you know, opportunities on the OTT side. Perfect. Thank you. Richie, um, a version of the same question to you, sort of uh, what are your ideal partners? How do you, you know, how, how would you want to demonstrate your value, I guess, to partners or have them understand your value? Yeah, so I think maybe I'll, I'll put out, we kind of serve the whole ecosystem, but I'll put them in like four quick buckets. I think for publishers, it's about um, working with publishers who want to you know, unlock um, the real value that's inside their, their IP, which is their content, and actually you know, build a data asset that can then help you know, monetize their inventory. For our data partners, it's about um, you know, partners who are looking to access video level data to bring their targeting or verif verification or measurement products into video. Um, for our ad platforms, it's about how do you offer transparency, either as a sell side platform or a buy side platform, whether it's targeting or verification, doesn't matter. Um, and then a buyer is, I mean, in all honesty, do you want to increase performance? Like putting an ad next to a piece of content that's contextually relevant actually works. It, it worked in social, it worked in search, it worked in display, it works in CTV as well. Um, and so anyone who's looking to increase performance of their dollars is, is a great a great uh, partner for us. You can just lead with that. Um, good all, one. All ecosystem, very, impo very important to us. <laughs> that is true. Mike, last licks to you, sir. Um, what's your, you know, what's the ideal partnership look like to you? And it can be across all, all parties on this, on this dais, right? So um, Mike, what do you think? I think the two most important people, the two most important entities in this entire advertising space and, and, and delivery space are going to be about the publisher, content creator, right? And then also the buyer, the advertiser itself. Advertisers are trying to reach their audience uh, and they're trying to improve the, their business of, product, of what they're selling. Publishers are trying to continue producing quality content, distribution, growing that audience, creating that product for this ecosystem. So everybody that sits in between, figuring out the best way to, re to get the best media value, but also the best margin, for the for the for the quality of content for the cost of the content um, is key. Now that's a delicate balance, right? Because on the DSP side, it's about getting the most most for for the for the buck, and on the SSP side, it's about getting uh, the most buck for the least amount of content, right? And I think instead of trying to drive both of those extremes, let's figure out ways to make that less of a far left, far right type conversation per se. I'm not talking political. I'm just talking on that type of spectrum and 
and, and figure out how to meet in the middle and be transparent. I'm fully transparent with all of our partners that buy from us, both the DSP level and SP level. Say, look, this is where we need to be at. Um, this is where we're sold out in these markets. We need to be above here to be able to continue producing this content. Anything below here, we're losing money. We're losing margin. We have to start removing people. We don't want that to happen. We want to continue growing. And so it's, it's a matter of understanding that. And from the audience perspective, audience members ha- are, are starting to continue to realize, um, as they know, content's not free. Entertainment's not free. And an audience is willing to exchange ad time for the quality for quality content for less cost. Um, but as that happens, that that those margins have to continue. They they can't be eroded, or else that quality content is going to go away, and we'll enter more of an ice age of content that's available to the masses. And no, none of us want that. No. Um, well, hopefully we um, hopefully this moved the needle a little bit forward. I think I mixed a yeah. metaphor there, so we'll just go with. I hope something um, something positive comes out of this. I think we're on the road to the right balance, and I um, uh, with you guys leading the charge. Um, maybe we'll come to some stasis. We can go complain about something else. Um, I uh, thank you guys. I look forward to talking to all of you guys individually soon. Um, I want to thank the audience. Um, if you guys were in person, I'd make you stand up and give the panelists a round of applause. Um, all of you guys for joining on the audience side. Thank you very much for taking the time with us. Guys, gentlemen, thank you so much for your insights and your expertise. It's greatly appreciated and I learned a ton and I will talk to you all very soon. Um, everyone be well and uh, have a great rest of your week. Bye now. Thanks, Steve. Thank, thank you. Guys. Thank you. Bye, guys.